What's up guys and gals and welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we're going to be checking out Desolation Tycoon. This is a game that's set in the post-apocalyptic future and as with many of the games that kind of blow my whistle, uh, this game is a merchant sandbox simulator. But it's got some interesting ideas that it's playing around with. Everything about this game from the presentation to just the general gameplay direction is interesting. At its core, this is a very, very casual game. Like, this is not a game that you're going to need to, like, stare at and run hard numbers and keep ledgers and things of that nature. Uh, it's definitely not EVE Online or anything of that sort. However, there is sort of a simplicity to the game that I think is actually laudable. And so anyways, we're going to dive on into Desolation Tycoon today. We're going to see if it's something that you wanted to add to your wish list. Uh, you can look down below in the description, and as per usual, I will have a link for you. On top of that, you'll also be able to check out a link to my Discord and my Twitch stream, just in case you wanted to hang out any day of the week. Uh, but let's go ahead and start a new game. So at the beginning of the game, uh, it's just going to give you a randomized character. There's not a whole lot of character building at the beginning of the game, although I would very much like to be able to design a character as an option. Uh, alas, as of right now, that's not a thing. You basically just reroll your stats, kind of D&D style, like old school, like uh, Warriors of the Eternal Sun style, until you get the stats where you want them to be. Uh, but every character is comprised of a number of different stats. You've got everything from talking, uh, which helps out with social interactions, to listening, uh, which allows you to get, like, XP and things of that nature. You've got fighting, which is your ability at resolving conflict in a violent way. You've got recruiting, which allows you to make your team bigger. You've got knowing and traversing and scouting and things of that nature. doesn't really matter what you start out with, because at the end of the day, like, all this stuff is going to level up naturally through its own usage. And if you're curious on how you get one of these up and you make them more powerful, all you got to do is check the tooltip. It'll actually more or less tell you, like, hey, this is the activity that you need to do in order to make this skill function better. But for the beginning of the game, the one that I think is most important is healing, planning, and traversing. Uh, so healing is exactly what it sounds like. It allows you to heal your men, the people that are part of your merchant caravan. Uh, planning is basically how long you can stretch your supplies out. In this game, you don't buy supplies. Every time you go to a town, you are resupplied just kind of like pro bono. And the amount of supplies that you get and how long they last are dictated by planning. And some of the trade runs in this game can be quite long. And so anyways, you want to have decent planning. And then traversing is just how fast you move around the map. And so like, something like that right there I actually think is pretty stellar. Uh, really good planning, solid healing, solid scouting, and then like passable traversal. But that levels up on its own, so I don't think we have to worry about it too much. Uh, so let's go ahead and name our character. I'm just going to be Splattercat. Nope, not Deplattercat. Splattercat. I'm not coming bearing cutlery. And then we'll start the game. I'm going to be a little green arrow. I like the little green arrow. I'm going to be the green arrow. Uh, so this is what the game looks like. This is literally all the graphical fidelity that you're going to get from this game from the beginning to the end. Uh, the entire game is presented in sort of a retro kind of Pentium 1 era uh, like 16-bit graphics format. There will be, as we hit events, as we're walking around, there will be little windows that pop up with little pictures and stuff like that. But by and large, this is very much a minimalist game. Uh, I do have things that I'd like to see changed around with the UI, but before we get to that, I usually try to do my thoughts at the end of the video, but for right now, we've got what day it is. On day 2000, we retire. And then we've got our speed right now, which is 91%. We've got how much health our main character has. He's at 100% health. We have how many injured crew we have in our current caravan. And then we have how many sick crew we have in our current caravan. One thing that I would like to see is, for example, when we go into, like, this menu right here, I would very much like for this little cutout right here that displays all of your various statistics, I would like for that to be on screen, like on the side right here or on the side right here. Even better, make it customizable so you can drag it to whatever part of the window you want. Foof! And that'd be the stuff right there. But as of right now, you gotta hit the tab key in order to go into this menu and see what you've got going on. But it basically tells us the exact same information that we already knew from kind of the previous, just in more detail. Uh, at the moment, we can take on five more recruits. Uh, at the moment, we have eight people on our crew. Uh, we have our injured crew and our sick crew over here. These are stories, warnings, and mysteries. 
the best way I know how to describe this mechanic is by kind of relating it to Sunless Sea or Sunless Skies, if you've played those games. Uh, these are effectively little snippets of information that you've picked up while you move around, and they play into a larger mechanic that's not important right now, but it will be important like an hour into the game, and that is the ability to build and upgrade and customize the map to your will by utilizing sort of schemes and intrigue. And so anyways, you're not just a trader in this game, you're also like an active participant in the building of the world. And in fact, that is what this game is all about from the beginning. So on the surface level, I didn't quite get this game when I first played it. I was like, alright, so it's like an ultra simplistic trade simulator. Yes and no. The trading simulator part of it is just kind of like the first part of the game. What this really is, is a roguelike. Uh, so if you die, or if the game ends for any reason, whether positive or negative, dying, retiring, that sort of stuff, uh, the progress that you've made, so you'll notice here in town, we have three agents right here, and we don't really get a lot of information about these people. Every town has three of its own people that kind of run things, and they have a symbol that's assigned to them. Uh, basically, what the symbol means is that if we buy or sell any goods that have the matching symbol for this agent, our reputation with them will go upwards. And then once you get up to 50 reputation, you can use your rumors and your mysteries and your warnings in order to participate in schemes that this particular agent in this particular town has underway, and that will have varying effects on the world. But the curious, interesting part about this game is that if your character dies, whatever modifications or schemes or things that you've done to change the game world, they stay and they advance. And so like your next character is actually chronologically after this character and all the things that he did and the progress that he makes will still kind of bear witness on the map. Like, if he decides to build a township over here, your next character, that township, might actually have grown and become more prosperous and have agents of its own now, so on and so forth. Uh, the game is very, very simple. You go to locations, you buy things, you sell things. Over here we have organic dyes, and it looks like we are the white dot right here. It looks like we can sell those up to the northeast of where we're at. A blue pip means that this item is in, de it's in demand somewhere, whereas an orange pip means that it is overstocked in that location and nobody wants it. It doesn't look like we can really do much else except for the dyes. We're also a little bit cash poor right now. So I'm going to go ahead and take that, and as you can see, that's filled up his meter a little bit. And then we're going to take these dies, and we're going to see if we can go make some nalds to the northeast. I think the next town over, it's actually almost directly north of us. The downside here is that we are going to have to traverse around some mountains, the terrain in this game. It does have an effect on your movement speed. Uh, we also have to pay upkeep along the way. So like in the early game, I would avoid really long trade runs uh, because you don't have the skills to support it. There's an event right there, possibly an attack or something of that nature. Here it looks like we can sell these dies for 128 a piece. I think we bought them in the last town for like 600 or 700 uh, for seven of them and so it appears as though we're going to make about a 25 profit on each one which means that we really didn't make that much money but what's cool about this is if you look at the symbol for the agent that we've never met before his reputation will go up because we are supplying that object to him and it's making his job or his cartel or his industry we don't really know in some way it's advancing this guy's goals in the game world and, and so like this is a very minimalist game that doesn't exactly tell you what's going on a lot of the time while you're playing with it, but what I sort of like about it is that it's got that same sort of ambience and mystery that something like Sunless Sea or Sunless Skies has, although to a lesser extent. I do think in certain cases, with some of the interactions and whatnot, the game could afford to be a tiny bit more verbose. Uh, it looks like we can actually just take this pottery or whatever this is, glassware. We can take that right back to where we came from. And so I think that's what I'm going to do. None of these other objects go back down and over there. As a useful utility as well, you can take a look at your map and it'll tell you exactly how many items you have that you can sell for like a good price in every town. So we have eight glassware right now and all of these towns have had a little eight put up above them. Let's head on back down. Alright, we've arrived. Along the way, I found a supply cache, too, so we got a little bit of extra stuff that we can sell. And the stuff that we're trying to sell is in demand. So that's even better. I don't have to hoof it all over the planet trying to figure out, like, exactly what I've got going on. This meter down here, I'm pretty sure, is the abundance. 
And so value goes up with trade and decays over time. Higher abundance causes selling cargo to be less profitable and increases the average quantity of goods you can buy. Okay, sounds good. So we're going to unload all this stuff over here. And in fact, that was a very, very profitable venture because we are now up by six. We're up, up by 600 nalds. Uh, we can't hire more crew over here if we wanted to. At the moment, we have five pack roaches. And it looks like we have three soldiers of fortune and not a whole lot else. The pack roaches, they'll allow us to carry more things. Uh, the soldiers of fortune. So all of these guys come with their own stats over on the right. Uh, you can take a look at the stats. I do think that the imagery could be shifted around a little bit on some of them because it's not like... I, so with a minimalist game like this, you want the player to be able to derive roughly what a thing does like over on kind of the side. And if you mouse over it, it'll 100% tell you. But some of the symbology, I guess, or the symbolism doesn't quite match up. So this is how much they get paid every week. Uh, this right here is how much they can carry. This right here is their work capacity. So there are sites in this game. You can find ruined towns and kind of like ruined locations and kind of old places. And if you have enough work capacity, you can sit there and you can basically just farm the node and get items out of it. Uh, over here, we have their combat ability. Uh, this one right here, I feel like the hammer could be a little... I thought it was a button, or I thought it was like a mushroom when I first saw it. I think the hammer could be a little bit more hammer-like. And then this right here is actually their combat ability. I would definitely recommend that not being a heart. Uh, hearts typically in video games represent like how much HP and whatnot something has, or like their constitution. Turning this into a little knife, or into like a little gun, or something like that, would basically make it instantly identifiable what that stat is. This guy right here is how menacing your dudes are um this is basically if your menace is really really high and you get a random event with people trying to attack you it's your ability to intimidate them and make them like piss off because your army is kind of scary so right here is your screening this determines if you're planning on retreating how much damage you will take while retreating so units that have a very high screening ability are effectively kind of like dragoons they're there to ride down fleeing enemies and also to kind of cover retreats and chasing armies uh, so some enemies will be really good at direct confrontation, and then some fighters will be really, really good at, like, protecting you while you run away. Uh, this right here is Discipline, and this effectively only matters in kind of, like, specific cases. Uh, it like, basically allows you to get, like, critical successes and whatnot in certain events. If we have, like, a short run around here, we do have a short run to the west. I wanted to go back up to the north, though. Unfortunately, they've only got the four dies, and that's not worth the run. What you really want to do is you want to bounce in between, like, two or three towns in this game until you've got your schemes leveled up. And then once you've got your schemes leveled up, it's going to give you some options for how you can, like, interact with the world. And then, like, if you pull off schemes, you can get, like, perks. So if you take a look at our character right now, let me see if I can open up our menu here. Uh, we are a xenophile, which means that we love people that are different from us. And so we have like lots of kind of options with diplomacy with people that are different than us, whether or not they be skin harvesters, things of that nature. Yes, uh, cannibal skin harvesters are a thing in this game. And in fact, they are their own formalized religion. Uh, but this will give you other options for kind of getting out of tricky situations. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to go to the West. We'll grab those two right there. Unfortunately, we're kind of over capacity to go to the west with that right there. We'll have one extra item, which will slow us down. It's a corrosion alloy. I'll take it. Why not? I mean, we're going to be a little bit overweight, but it's only slowed us down by like 18%. And we have such a massive amount of supplies because we started with a really high stat in planning that I'm not really too worried about. It. That's an event right there. It can be good. It can be bad. Those pop up based on your scouting skill. Is Narhara the place we're trying to go? It is indeed. Okay, so at least it wasn't a long run either. So we'll go ahead and take this over to this side and see if we can stack up a few more Nalds. All right, so we're getting 94 per. Yeah, we should be in the market for some pretty pretty serious advancement right there. Good trade run, and it almost half leveled us up with that contact, so you'd love to see that. We got anything that can go back to the east? We do, but it's only a six-item run. We have simple weapons. Those only go up to the north. We do have a run to the northeast that I think we could take. So I'm going to go ahead and take it. Uh, we do get reputation for each individual item we carry on behalf of their cartel or whatever. Every time we go to town, we may get warnings. We may get stories. They just sort of accumulate over time until they become useful. But I'm going to run some goodies around for kind of 10, 15 minutes and see where we end up. Well, we've been a trader for about three months now. We've made a little bit of money, and I've expanded the crew size a bit. We got a few more pack roaches around, prodding around with their little antennas. 
things are going pretty good, but as you can see, our overhead has become, like, sort of monstrous. Big run right here, though, for, like, 1200 bucks, and we should get a ton of reputation for dropping that one off. So there you go. Now, if you're wondering where we're at on the map, we just worked our way around kind of a destroyed city up the mountain range over here and kind of like moved probably 25 objects from down here over to here. One of the benefits of having a larger crew is that we can carry way, way, way more cargo if we want to. And in fact, we are going to have to. We're going to have to carry more cargo just to make up for the fact that our overhead costs are just like nutty right now. Uh, it looks like we've got a really short run up to the north right there. So I feel like we can pull that off pretty easily. Let's go ahead and take all three of those. And it looks like we've just got to go up to the northeast ever so slightly. Yeah, I mean, it's like right above us. So this is the perfect spot for a trade lane right here. There are randomized events in the game. So there will be sandstorms and things like that. Unfortunately, there's no graphics for those as of yet. Oh, aggressive flesh-eating beetles that are easy to mistake for docile scarabs. They can smell blood over long distances and are able to form spontaneous, ravenous swarms. Okay, so they're basically like the things from the mummy. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and fight them off. If I get any injured crew, that's fine. That's like what they're here for. Their job is to be guards, so like be a guard. Uh, we're at 63% health right now. You heal slowly over time based on your healing rate. Uh, time heals all things as it goes with this game. Wow, that was actually a pretty profitable short little run. Nice, good to see. And if I can take these back somewhere, that'd be great. Doesn't look like I can, though. I suppose I could take some of the bleak biles right now and take those up to the north. Yeah, we'll go ahead and grab those real quick. So I need to go over to here. I need to drop off those 15 items, and then I need to take the other seven up top. Basically, I, I ran a trade circuit down in the bottom. Oh, one of my soldiers died. Well, that's not great. Okay, continue fighting. It's more It's more scarabs. We gotta do what we gotta do. Apparently, we failed our healing check roll, so the guy died, unfortunately, instead of recovering. He got himself a real bad case of desert gangrene. Or gang yellow. I don't know what it would be called in the desert. Something like that. Uh, if you don't have good scouting, these will pop up far closer to you. And some of them are like landmines, and so having high scouting can really help you avoid sort of issues and attrition. Uh, apparently, I ran out of money. That's my bad. I didn't mean to. Here, let me replenish the coffers ever so slightly. I was so excited about having, like, a super awesome opportunity to move trade goods around that, unfortunately, I didn't see what it was costing me. Uh, if we have anything that can go, like, one step to the north, that's what I'd prefer to grab. We do not have anything that can go one step to the north, though. So we kind of got to run this leg kind of got to run that leg without really man I was hoping we pick something up right here that we could take up there rip okay well back on the road again I guess we just resupplied so like maybe it won't be that bad off on the road walking across the desert uh, that right there is one of the potential places you can start a town so they have like kind of like a ghostly I guess blueprint right there uh, once you actually level up all your trade vendors and your contacts in town you can use them to build your own cities and whatnot to kind of fill in some of the larger, bleaker areas. There we go. Now we're sitting on some money. We are unfortunately going to have to rehire some crew, so I'm going to get another Soldier of Fortune added on in. We've got 15 fighting capability right now. Not bad, not bad. Shouldn't we have 18 fighting capability? I feel like we should probably have 18 fighting capability, but then again, I guess we don't. We got 15 working capability, but, like, why get busy working when I can get busy just kind of hustling things in between locations? You know what I mean? Like, one of them seems like it's an awful lot of work. So we've got aromatics over here that we can take over there. I mean, it looks like a joint to me, but it's kind of hard to tell with the graphics. All this stuff is going east, or we can take it hard southwest and get back down into this little quadrant where we're popular. Let's go for the short run. I feel like short runs always go better for me. We are healing up nicely, so that's good. Glad to see the HP is slowly ticking upwards. Mm, I'm going to leave that alone. My health's still a little bit low. Oh, my soldier of fortune died. They're not healing, man. Oof. 
Uh, you do get new units. You may have noticed that there's a whole bunch of units that have question marks on them. Those are also a part of the scheme. So as you level up your reputation with these guys on the side, they will give you access to like brand new units that do varying things and like are hybrid versions of other units. Stuff like that that will give you a little bit more adaptability. As far as I know, they stay unlocked in between runs. I haven't had a chance to do that yet, but like maybe someday. Let's drop off all these goodies over here. We came out like 300 up. The downside is I gotta get another guard over here. Oh, they actually don't have Soldiers of Fortune here. Okay, so I guess we're just gonna take a little knocking as far as our wounds go. You can start replacing some of your guys. So a Soldier of Fortune gives you three attack, no menace, and he costs 12. A trained guard gives you five attack. So he's almost twice as good as the normal little guy, but he also gives you menace, and he also gives you the ability to do kind of critical abilities in combat that allow you to get special results. Might be worth it, but I'd have to downsize on my Soldiers of Fortune. So, like, our total attack right now actually went down, but we have a little bit of menace and we have a little bit of discipline now. Suppose I could ditch two of them and we'll just take these guys on right here. Seems okay to me. We'll start going for the good soldiers, I guess. The ones that have a little bit more oomph to them. What's my total overhead? 160? All right. So we're going to take some of this stuff. That would take us back down to the southward quadrant. We've got artifacts over here. We've got purified salt. We've got corrosion alloys. Yeah, let's pick this guy up. We'll cut south and we'll see if that little stop right there in the middle of the map. Maybe we can pick up some more stuff right there and sort of move them around. One thing I think they do need to work on is, for example, right now we have a sandstorm, but there's no kind of visual flare telling you that there's a sandstorm. So, like, I feel like a really, really simple way to denote that there's a sandstorm is just to have, like, tricolor pixels, like a three-by-one tricolor pixel thing. Just kind of like seven or eight of them traveling sideways across your field of view. The other option is that they could put in some kind of fog effect along the edges that sort of comes in and goes out sort of in a sandy brownish color. That might work out as well just to let you know that there's some kind of like event happening at the moment. And I feel like the lack of that actually is not good. Like you gotta, you gotta have the immersive stuff in here because it's clear that this game is going to be, this game is shooting for being kind of a quiet, atmospheric, um, I guess, casual trading game. And I think that sort of gameplay style really benefits from immersion and sort of like sinking into the experience and losing track of time. They did a great job on the soundtrack. I think that it actually sounds fantastic. It sort of varies in between like Western sounding music and also sort of more intense stuff, which I think is good. That goes all the way down to the south. Where am I going right now? I'm going to this guy right here. So I'll take that, add that to the pile. And then we'll take the three glassware, the nine glassware, and we'll take that all the way down to the bottom here. Okay, first drop-off point. There's a thousand bucks right there. Sounds good. I picked these up on the way. I don't know what they are. They're something. Uh, is there anything else that's going south right here? Indeed there is. There's more glassware. All right, we're going to be like the glassware king out here. Everything else they have going on is going north. A living delicacy. So what do you mean, like crickets or something? Like, I don't know what we eat in the desert, man, but I'm going to guess it's bugs. I kind of feel like it's probably bugs, given the fact that we ride cockroaches and we've been attacked by, like, scarabs and, like, other stuff. It's got to be a bug, right? It's got to be some delicious-looking bug like the ones from The Lion King. Okay, big sell-off here. Very nice. If we can get her up a little bit higher will be solid so there you go we now officially have access to schemes uh, so let's see here when buying offers are twice as large that lasts for 90 days when buying offers are twice as large last 30 days it looks like we can execute a scheme for five stories let's go ahead and do it when buying offers are twice as large okay so apparently we got the negative outcome so the number of dishonest outcomes with this character. So basically, it's how many times we passed and failed while fiddling with this character's schemes. Uh, their scheme was to make the offers much, much larger. And in fact, that scheme has worked amazingly well, in fact. 
uh, I can run 14 of these right up to the north real fast. And the nice thing about that is with the double offers, we get trust by the unit of what we buy and sell. So with that 30 days running right there, this was a big opportunity to basically instantly half level up an entire agent. So that'll be nice. I don't know if I want to touch that or not. Sometimes I click on things and good things happen. Sometimes I click on things and bad things happen. We'll go ahead and unload these over here. And that, in fact, has almost gotten there with another vendor as well. If you've got anything that's going slightly to the southwest, I'll take it. You do. We have another scheme over here. So we can spend 10 of our mysteries to get five levels of knowing or one level of knowing. Go for it. All right. So we only got the one level of knowing, unfortunately. So we got rooked. But we at least knew something. What does knowing even do? Let's see here. Skillet collecting and retaining facts on topics that are best known about, not personally experienced. Unlocks better outcomes during demonic encounters. You can increase this by reading books. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, we got a lot of stuff to take to the Southwest. So let's get on that and kind of get our cash back up. And then we'll decide how we want to... I guess fill out the troop, I suppose. Okay, big money, big prizes. We're down here. Doesn't actually look too bad. And we've almost got her leveled up as well. She's got this little crisscross symbol. We can take those back up to the northeast. I don't see why that would be too bad. What scheme do you have? Instantly refresh all offers in the buy section. Instantly refresh one random offer. Okay. I don't know if that's just like a 50-50 split, like it flips a coin right there. Might be a good idea to put percentages or something underneath these so that you know before you go in that, like, the character is gambling uh, effectively on what the outcome is going to be. So far, we've gotten nothing but dishonest outcomes. I'm starting to get kind of a dubious opinion of people that live out here in the desert. I'm beginning to feel like maybe they aren't looking out for my best interest, and instead, they may be acting entirely on selfishness. I know, who would have ever guessed that in a world populated by humans, that would be the case? Who would have ever surmised? But anyways, this is Desolation Tycoon. So anyways, let me give you my thoughts here. I've played the game for about two hours, so it's not quite a first impressions, but it's also not like a full seven, eight hour playthrough where this is coming from. This is kind of like I've gotten my first taste. I've played with it a little bit last night, played with it a bit this morning, and then I recorded the video. But I always try to be honest about how much experience I have with the game because, you know, that's an important thing for you as a viewer to be aware of. Like, if I've put 10 hours into a game, I think that, like, my critiques or my observations are going to be a lot more sharper and focused. Whereas if it's a first impression, I'm kind of just, like, speedballing. This one's kind of somewhere in between those two. But Desolation Tycoon is a game that's firing in some interesting directions. Uh, we didn't really have the opportunity to get super far in this video, but it does open up a bit with goals and things to accomplish after the first hour or so. As you started to see near the end of the video, we started to get like extra options and things that we could do. Uh, the core gameplay loop is well implemented, if somewhat simple. And if you like trading games, that's exactly what this game is, and it doesn't really try to pretend to be anything else. Uh, the trading interface is really easy to figure out. I do enjoy the quality of life additions that allow you to easily see when and where things need to be sold at and in that implementation they kind of avoid the stumbling ground that a lot of other trading games have that's that groping around in the dark feeling you get in the early days of other trading games before you find all the op trade routes and like where everything goes uh, i've never been a big fan of that phase of trading games and so anyways i do like that straight from the beginning it's like get item here take item there like that's fine as mentioned earlier in the video I do think some small modifications to the UI would be nice or at least make things a little bit more visually accessible without having to open menus but that's a really really little gripe uh, the game is not in early access so I'm not exactly sure what plans the developers have to continue support for the game but in that interest I'll fire off a couple of observations here that I've noticed along the way that would help the game out with its immersiveness because I think that's really the angle that the game is going for from the soundtracking and whatnot uh, Firstly, the game world is really static. It does change because of your actions, but I do feel like adding roaming NPCs and creatures to the map rather than just kind of text pop-ups and scouting icons would lend a bit more life to the world. The way I kind of envision in my head is that your scouting level has a vision circle around the party that is invisible to the player, but it gets larger as you level up. That way, instead of seeing like a little pit pop-up that you walk up to and interact with, uh, you actually see the 
little creatures, people, cannibals, whatever, approaching. And then they could have, like, minor AI to, like, chase you and whatnot. Uh, this would make the runs a little bit more interesting in between locations by forcing the player to divert from their planned path and go around different directions in order to avoid taking damage. I'd also like the caravan to be a actual proper caravan on the world map rather than an arrow. Like, even if it's just like a series of little black dots that are like two by one high, um, a visual validation that your party has grown with each new recruit adding sort of to the length of the caravan, I think would do wonders and be a really cool way for the player to physically gauge how far they've come over the course of a run. I think that NPC caravans moving around on the map would enliven the world a bit, even if they were passive and you couldn't interact with them, and they didn't affect the deals or the economy of the game, just seeing other little groups moving around, I think would enliven it up ever so slightly. A proper combat system would have been good, where the units like auto battle and kind of like a 2D Final Fantasy style fight. Uh, that would be kind of cool instead of the game's current text-based system where you just kind of touch a pip, gain something, or lose something based on the odds. Uh, I think the soundtrack is fantastic. I don't have any complaints on that end. The sound effects are crisp and they get the idea across of what's happened, whether it's paying your troops or gaining health or whatever. But curiously, a lot of the audio feedback for like paying wages and whatnot was disabled in my options by default. So like if you're going to get the game, make sure you enable those in the options if you're planning on playing and want a little bit more ear feedback. I like the pixel art, even though it's minimal. I'm, I've never had a problem with minimalism. I play ASCII games and whatnot, so that's, like, fine by me. And actually, I think the devs did a really good job in selecting the color palette for the game. Uh, it gels nicely to the eyes. I also really like that progress towards building towns and other various activities are advanced and also retained in between runs. So anyways, the game's like got a lot of interesting little things going on. I'm hoping they continue to support it and fiddle around with it and add an extra little, you know, bit of polish to it. Uh, I haven't had any bugs or any other problems, no crashes. And so I'd say it's an interesting little game. And then if it gets some sprucing up and kind of like a coat of accent paint to really make, uh, you know, the main presentation of the game pop or like the main mechanics of the game pop uh, i think it could really get under some trade gamers skins uh, my name is splattercat i sift through the pile to find what's worthwhile in the world of indie games every single day so you don't have to today up on the chopping block we had desolation tycoon tomorrow we will have something else thanks for hanging out leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it and i will see you all later